Bibles to John chapter 11. The miracle we didn't get to last week that I wanted to get to is uh, where we're going to start this week. So let's pray and we'll dig in. Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for your many blessings to us. God, you're so good to us. And I pray that you'd help us to always remember that. God, I pray that as we look into your word, that you'd help us to understand what we're, we're looking at. Help us to take what we learn about you and to live more like you. And Lord, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. John chapter 11. Um, well, let's, let's just read it real quick. Start, start with me in uh, verse... Go with verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Uh, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord of ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, unto Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, uh, he said This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Mary and Martha, and uh, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days, and still in the same place where he was. Then after he saith unto his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. So Jesus gets word that Lazarus had gotten sick. Now later, <coughs> later in these verses we find out that... Uh, that Lazarus had been dead for four days by the time Jesus get, gets there. So, practically what that means is, by the time the messenger got to Jesus and said, Lazarus is sick, that's the same day he died. Lazarus died, probably as the messenger is telling Jesus, Lazarus is sick. And so Jesus tells the messenger, don't worry, this isn't, uh, isn't going to be bad for him, this sickness is not unto death, is what he says. Think about that. So probably as Jesus is telling the messenger, his sickness is not unto death. Lazarus is dead. Or died. You know, he's passing out of this world as Jesus is telling the messenger. So the messenger gets back. You can just imagine. I mean, it's not told to us here, but you can just imagine the messenger coming back, giving the word to Mary and Martha, saying, Don't worry, Jesus said he's not going to die. But he's dead? You know that? So... Then Jesus waits two more days after that. Remember, that was the day Lazarus died. Jesus waits two more days, and then he takes his journey to where Mary and Martha are. That's a day's journey. So, four days. By the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus has been dead four days. And so, Mary and Martha both have the same reaction when they see Jesus. Uh, Martha runs out and meets Jesus. And Mary kind of hangs back in the house. And... Uh, when Martha gets to Jesus, she says, Lord, if you had just been here, if you had just come to us, he wouldn't have died. Now, her reasoning is a little bit faulty, because by the time the messenger got to Jesus, Lazarus was already dead. But, uh, so, then Jesus comes with her to the house. Mary says the same thing to Jesus. So, you know, they, you can tell they, they've been talking. In the time they've been waiting for Jesus... They've been talking to each other. It's common. You know, when, when things happen in our lives, we want to have someone to talk to, someone to bounce things off of, someone to commiserate with us, someone to kind of share that sympathy and empathy, share that hurt with us. And they've been sharing that with each other about their brother Lazarus, whom the Bible says Jesus loved their family. And so Jesus gets there, and Mary and Martha both give him the story of, well, Jesus... I appreciate you coming, but if you had been here sooner, I don't think they realize who they're talking to. Because, I mean, if they if they knew what Jesus had done, they have to have known. If if his if this family was really as close to Jesus, you know, Jesus loves their family. They take part. Wouldn't they have known? Jesus has already raised people from the dead. So, what's different here? What's different here is he was already dead and buried. He was already in the tomb. He was already four days. He had already started decomposition. He had already, and you see down there, uh, 
the sisters tell him, Lord, Lord, by this time, he's stinking. He's, you don't want to go in there, okay? And so, look what Jesus does. Um, Jesus tells him to take heart. He's going to rise again. Uh, verse 24, uh, 23, Jesus says, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus is trying to tell her, I'm going to raise him from the dead right now. And she's going, well, I know he's going to come. He's going to resurrect someday and go to heaven. And Jesus is going, anyway. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth, believeth in me, that shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, yea, Lord, I believe. Skip down. Uh, Jesus, verse 34, he said, and where have you laid him? And they said unto him, come and see. Shortest verse in the Bible is next. Jesus wept. It's the only time uh, that we see Jesus weeping about something else a person has done. We don't, we don't see Jesus crying about circumstances. But here, Jesus shows his compassion for Lazarus. He weeps for him. Um, look at verse 38. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, come to, came to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Um, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which said, or which stand by, I said it. That, that, that they might believe that thou hast sent me. So Jesus is praying out loud for them to hear. Lord, I'm, I thank you that you've heard me. I know you always hear me, but I'm praying this, thanking you for hearing me because they all need to know it. Then, uh, end of verse 43, look what he says. Anybody have uh, red letters in your Bible? Look what Jesus says. Three words. Somebody tell me. Lazarus has come forth. Lazarus come forth. Um, what do you think would have happened if Jesus had just said, come forth? They in a graveyard, people. There would have been a lot of people coming back to life right there. Okay, So Jesus calls Lazarus by name. That way, only the guy he's aiming at comes out. So Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says that as soon as he had said that, and he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot in grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin, and Jesus said unto him, Loose him, and let him go. Now, two things about this. One, you see, the Bible says that he was bound hand and foot. But it says that he that was dead came forth. How? If he was tied up in grave clothes, and Jesus had to tell him, Loose him, and let him go. I kind of think this is, not, not to be all theatrical, but... I think the power of God brought him out. I think I don't think the Bible doesn't say he was walking, because that would have been a really easy verb to throw in there. He was walking forth, but no, it says that he came forth. I think God brought him out. I mean, he was probably floating or dragging. I don't know. But um, then, whenever they, whenever they, he came out of the grave through his own hopping, like Miss Caroline thinks, or. Whether it was the power of God that just like floated him out, I don't know. Uh, then Jesus said, loose him and let him go. The other part of this is just kind of comical. You have to be real careful about how you translate the Bible. Because the word for loose right there can also mean destroy. So the same word means two different things. We have that in English as well. So you got to kind of read and make sure... That you know what it's what the passage is saying, because Jesus was not saying, "Hey, I just raised this guy back to life. Why don't you go destroy him?" <laughs> Boom! You know that's that's not what he's saying. I I tell you that to tell you this. Listen, you have to be real careful with God's word. You have to make sure when someone quotes scripture to you, or preaches scripture to you, or tells scripture to you, that you're reading it, you're hearing it, and you're absorbing it in context. That you're getting the whole meaning of what the whole passage says. Because if you were to just look at this phrase in Greek, 
it would say destroy him. Right? You could take it either loose him, uh, to untie him, or to destroy him. And if you just look at that phrase, it can go either way. But, as you read the passage, you get the context, and you understand very clearly <coughs> that it doesn't, Jesus wasn't saying to kill the guy. Right? If you destroy someone, they're dead, right? So, Jesus wasn't saying, kill the man I just raised back to life. Right? So, read biblical text in its biblical context. The whole thing. Get the idea of where it's going. And that will make it more clear to you when you take those things. Okay? That was not part of this story, but it's very important. Okay? Uh, now, we need, a, we need to switch gears a little bit. We've got one more thing I want to go through with you before we get out of here, and we've got very little time. So switch, switch, turn over to Luke chapter 15. We looked at a, um, a Jesus miracle, now we're going to look at a Jesus parable. Okay? We've seen an act of Jesus, now we're going to see some teaching of Jesus. Luke chapter 15. Jesus is teaching. Now remember, this is right before the last week of Jesus' life. And we're going to get into that Sunday morning in Sunday school, so don't miss it. Um, so Jesus is giving. Uh, well, let's let's look at it. You'll see you'll see the context in here. Hey, that's like what I was talking about. Uh, then drew near unto him, unto Jesus, the publicans and sinners, for to hear him. You know what a publican was? A publican was a well, practically a publican was a cheat. They were tax collectors, and tax collectors were notoriously dirty. Okay, the government-sanctioned theft is what they were all about. Okay, so Jesus spent time with publicans and sinners. Whenever you see Jesus spending time with publicans, the next word is always and sinners. He's always lumping those two together, and he's always spending time with them. He's eating with them. He's communing with them. Why? Was Jesus carousing with them? Was he taking part in their sin? No, Jesus was ministering to them, trying to help them know him and what he was about. He was trying to save them. That's why Jesus came. So, the scribes and the Pharisees, verse 2, the Pharisees and the scribes, they murmured, saying, This man, Jesus, this man receiveth sinners, and he eateth with them. And they were repulsed by this. Because the, the optics of their religion, the way they looked in their religion, was very important to them. And that's all it was, was religion and the way it looked. To them, to be seen with those sinners, known sinners. That was scandalous. And they were, they were repulsed at the very idea that Jesus would claim to teach the word of God and would still hang out with those people. So Jesus, he, he decides to take him to school again. Verse 4. So he looks at him and he says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of the sheep, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he come, cometh home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now, we know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every sinner needs repentance. But Jesus is talking to the Pharisees on, on their, uh, their idea of how things look. He said, Jesus was saying, there's going to be way more joy in heaven over one sinner that comes to repentance than one of you that look like you don't need any repentance. And you won't have any. The, the Pharisees weren't going to repent. They weren't. Why? Why wouldn't the Pharisees repent, Ethan? Shake your head at me. Good answer. Doug, why wouldn't they repent? Because they followed Jesus. They didn't think they needed repentance, did they? Yes. They didn't think there was anything that they needed to repent from. But that's the difference in the sinner. The sinner knew. The publican knew. <laughs> he might not have wanted to admit it to people, but he knew. When he went home, he, he knows, I'm cheating people. I'm a sinner. 
And Jesus was seeking the lost. He was trying to save the sinners. So Jesus tells them something that they would all be very familiar with. A shepherd and sheep. Uh, and he says, look, you might have a hundred, and one of those sheep gets lost, but you're not going to be like, well, I beat the spread. I got 99% of them. We're good. No, you're going to go find the sheep. Each sheep was precious to the shepherd. For personal reasons, they were his. And for uh, monetary reasons, if he were to lose one of the sheep, that was money out of his pocket. So each sheep mattered very much to the shepherd. He gives another parable. He says, either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one, uh, doth not light a candle in the house, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends, and her neighbors together were saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repented. Now, this was the idea of this was a bride, in order to signify that she was now married, she would have sort of a headpiece that would have those ten pieces of silver attached to it. And to lose one of those pieces of silver is, is sort of the idea of our modern, modern day wedding band. Uh, or engagement ring, and for one of those pieces of silver to be gone out of it, that's catastrophic. And so the the picture Jesus paints is, you know, in, in the dark house, she lights the candle, she's looking, she's really trying to seek this thing out, and when she finds it, she's happy. So, parable one and parable two, the sheep and the coin, those are something that's lost, and the owner trying to find it. That's that's the picture of Jesus coming to save sinners, okay? And that's what he's preaching to the, the Pharisees right now. Jesus coming to us to save us. Now look at parable number three. He kind of goes a different way. The first two parables show God's sovereignty and his mercy toward us in coming to earth. Then we have the parable of the prodigal son. Let's read it together, verse 11. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said unto his father, Father, Give me the portion of goods that followeth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took a journey into a far country. And there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose, and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and he is found, and they began to be merry. So, here we have sort of the opposite. We have the son that's lost, after we had the sheep that was lost and the coin that was lost. Okay, The sheep and the coin did not come back to the master. The master had to seek them out. So that's the picture of God coming to us. Here we have the picture of the responsibility of man. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. This son went astray. He went to his father, and he said, You know what, Dad? I'm unhappy around here. Why don't you just give me my inheritance now, and let me take care of myself? And so, his dad honors his wish. Says he divided unto his sons his living. Gave them both their inheritance. And the one stayed home, the one took off. And, by the way, we, we call this the parable of the prodigal son. You'll notice that nowhere in the passage do we read the word prodigal. What the word prodigal means is wasteful or excessive. And that, that fits this kid, right? He goes into a far country and he starts 
going to excess. I mean, the Bible says he wasted his living with riotous living. Wasted all he had with riotous living. That means it was crazy around his house. There was always a party going on. There was always food and drink and everything happening. And it was happening here. Until his money ran out. This tells me he's a lot like today's lottery winners. Did you know, this is just kind of by the way, when a person wins the lottery, hits the jackpot, millions of dollars, on average it's five years before they're in debt again. In debt again? Just seems a little ridiculous to me. Heard about a guy the other day, yesterday, talking about a guy who won $9 million in the lottery. And it was less than five years before he was... In his own words, he was broke. That's amazing. Anyway, so this kid was just like that. This kid goes off into a far country. He wastes his father's inheritance with riotous living. Goes nuts. And then, as soon as everything's gone, the Bible says, a famine hit the land. Nobody has anything. And so he goes and tries to find work. He can't find work. The only job he can find is slopping pigs. And think about who Jesus is talking to here. He's talking to Jews who pigs are unclean. They wouldn't there were no pig farmers, okay? This was <clears throat> this was unclean. This was off limits. This was mm, we don't even talk about that. And so they're picturing this Jewish boy that goes off and to a far country and now he's having to be a pig farmer? Not even a farmer, but he's the one that slops the hogs. And on top of that, this wasn't just Jews. This was the Pharisees. This was These were the people that were all concerned about how things looked. And so, they're thinking, mm, this is bad. And so this, this boy, the Bible says it was so bad for him that he, would, he was about to eat the slop. He was given the hogs. Until one day he came to himself. Look at that. Verse 17, and when he came to himself, means epiphany. He had a re realization. He came to himself. He said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? He said, I'm just going to go back and I'm going to try and be like one of my father's servants. Because at least they're eating better than I'm eating. And so he came to himself. <coughs> and he goes back and he tries to join himself to his father again. He repents. The word repent means to change direction. We've talked about this before. If you're going this way, you change direction. It's the exact opposite direction. It's a 180 degree turn. You go from here to here. And when you do that, your scenery changes. The things you're looking at change. Right? I'm looking at this wall, now I'm looking at that wall. I'm going this way, now I'm going that way. So he repented, and his scenery changed. He went back home. He went back to where he had been before, where he was close to the Father. Funny thing, this boy was not the only prodigal in this passage. When he got, look, look what happens. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was a great way off, his father saw him. You know what that tells me? His father was watching for him. His father had his eyes way down the road going, maybe one day I'll see him. Maybe his father had had false starts before, saw somebody coming down the road, and took off off the porch and was like, oh, no, I ain't him. And so this day, he sees him, he's still excited, takes off down the road, saw him a great way off, took off running, had compassion on him, and ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. The Father's love is the other thing that's excessive in this passage. His compassion, His mercy, His grace was excessive. This is the prodigal father. He was very excessive to his son. He didn't have to give him a thing. He had already given him his inheritance. Kid, this is all I owe you. You took it, you wasted it, get out of here. That's all the Father owed him. And yet when he saw him, he still said, you know what, he might have wasted everything I gave him. He might have done really dumb stuff. He might be broken and battered. He might be really bad off. But he's still my son. And he loved him. He ran and he hugged.
hugged him, he kissed him, and he dressed him like a son again. Look at what the father did. The father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. He said, look, this kid doesn't even look like mine. Make him look like mine again. Put, a, put one of my robes on him. Put a, the best robe I have on him. Get the ring, the ring that sh shows sonship. Put that on him. Put shoes on his feet. Go kill the fatted calf. We are having filet mignon. Yeah. It's in the Bible, folks. Steak no is in the Bible. Okay? Jewish. Come on, we already talked about this. So, he treats him not as a servant like the, the kid asked for. The kid said, Father, make me like one of your, your servants. And the father said, Nonsense! Get the robe, get the ring, get the shoes, get the food! Woo! It's party time! And they partied for the son! Why? Because the father was excessive too. Look at this. The three phases of the son. And I want you to see the response of the father and how it relates to Jesus. If you remember John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Remember? Look at this. The three phases of the son. He was lost. He goes into the foreign country, and he wastes everything he's got. Famine comes, he's got no job, he's got no place to be. He's lost. His life in that country is over. He's lost. Jesus says, I'm the way. He's ignorant. Completely ignorant. What was he doing? But look at verse 17. He says, he came to himself. He had a realization. So before that, he was ignorant. Jesus says, I'm the truth. Jesus has the answer to everything this man, this son had. This, everything this son needed. He was lost. Jesus is the way. He was dumb, ignorant. Jesus is the truth. The father says, this my son was dead and he is alive again. So he was dead. Jesus is the life. He was lost. Jesus is the way. He was dumb. Jesus is the truth. He was dead. Jesus is the life. Everything that we need, everything that we can come in, in, into in our lives, Jesus is the answer. He is what we need. He is exactly what this prodigal son needed. This lost son, this excessive, wasteful son, answered by the excessive father. The excessive stupidity and waste of the son was answered by the excessive love and compassion of the father. This my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. This is why Jesus came. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Yes, Jesus came to earth to save us from our sins. But Jesus told the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin to show why he was here. But Jesus didn't leave it there. Because our salvation is not automatic just because we were born into this world. We are saved when we take care of our part. When we repent. That's why Jesus told the story of the son. Yeah, you have the sheep and the coin. The master sought them out to save them. But there's also something we have to do on our part. We have to repent. We have to accept the gift. Without that, there is no salvation. Without repentance, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So unless you accept the gift of God, it's not your gift. You can't have it unless you receive it. Jesus clears it up real quick for the Pharisees. Why is he hanging around with publicans and sinners? Because the ones that are lost are the ones that are in need. And the Pharisees didn't know how bad they were on the inside. They were only looking on the outside going, look how good I am. So Jesus spent his time with those that knew they needed him. That's who Jesus came to die for. The sinner. The one like me. I'm lost. I can't do anything about it myself. He came for me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you.
thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you are so excessive in your love for us, your compassion for us, your mercy and your grace toward us. God, I pray that if there's somebody here that doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray that they would accept that gift tonight. Repent from their sins. Turn to you and live for you. Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, that we would be examples of what it is like to be someone that lives for you. 